Thanks, Aidan. And the next 40 minutes or so had better be all about Tim, hadn't they? Yes. Um, Tim, it's here. Yes. To have a radio programme is a very nice thing. It is. It is a very nice thing. And now you have the radio programme, and you have the book of the radio programme, and you have the CD of the radio programme. You must, you must be thrilled. I mean, you must be absolutely delighted that it's turned out the way it has. Well... I think it, um, the only taste that I'm not quite sure it meets is taste. The only sense, rather, sorry. Um, it's beautiful to look at, it's wonderful to listen to, it feels good, and it actually has that nice smell that a good book should have too, so. <coughs> and, and I haven't eaten it yet. Having spent the time with it, having had the privilege of spending the time with it before everybody else or before most other people going through it, and listening to the music, looking at the pictures, and reading your beautifully written text. Um, I can say it's, it's a little bit like listening to the radio on a, on a Sunday morning. Good. It's uh, the expression of a passionate love of music and involvement with music, which goes back many years, and which we, I'd like to talk a, about a little bit, if you would. I think, and this went against my earlier preconceptions in this regard, um, I think it goes back, I know it goes back to your family and to your upbringing and so on, but I think, I think it goes back to your mother in particular. Well, um, my mother's, uh, mother came from a very musical family. The genes, the musical genes are very strong. And there's one story which perhaps um, tells just how very strong um, uh, 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 this whole musical uh, uh, gene has, has been through, through the generations. It was my great-grandfather who um, used to play string quartets at home and told my grandmother, told my grandmother that under no circumstances should the music be interrupted. And so there was one evening when the mu door of the music room opened and uh, uh, my grandmother and the siblings arrived and stood and waited to the end of the movement and then said, Papa, the house is on fire. <laughs> and it was. So uh, a, str a strong musical sense um, that, you know, it's simply part of life and how on earth could one manage without it? Was your mother a practicing musician? Not musician really. Practice? I mean, uh, it, she learned as a child. There wasn't a huge amount of, of music actually in the house when I grew up. But I was lucky enough to, to be born and, and grow up in Cambridge. So music was abounding of all sorts everywhere. And there was a huge advantage, certainly. Um, not just sacred music at that stage? Or was no, it, no, does, does sacred music come in first and the other music's coming? No, after? no, no. It, it, it was all milling around from the very beginning. I mean, I remember getting Dixieland on, on my father's uh, radio when I was very, very young. So the jazz clubs of Cambridge and Bartok string quartets down to the Guildhall, you know, there was so much music going on in that city. Uh, and I just reveled in it all. But King's College Chapel was the most important place, really, for, for me. That's where I... Even then, and not just in reputation? Yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, I remember mitching from school. Uh, I didn't like cricket too much, and I used to walk along the fens to Evensong at the age of about maybe 14, 15. And uh, it was very powerful influence, and of course still is. Was it music that drew you to chapel, or...? Were yes, you going there anyway? I think probably um, it was definitely the music that was, would draw me to chapel. And I think probably the music, the aesthetic, is what still draws me to church. Um, so it is still my love of, of not just music, but aesthetics generally, um, that is probably uh, the most important element of what one might call my faith. We might come back to that, but stay with, it, with your upbringing. Sure for the moment. Um, the church going happens almost incidentally from the way, from the way you describe it. Uh, your mother, I think, was a church goer. Yes, yes she was, but towards the end of uh, her life, really, I mean, my father lied about his age in order to join his brother in the trenches at Ypres, where he found it rather difficult to find God. So although his father was a Baptist minister, I think there was a, um, a, a, you, not a, a lot of um, 
uh, religion in, in my upbringing per se. Does your music, interest in music, and in church music in particular, get pursued actively at this stage? Are you singing in choir? Yes, I'm at school. I, I, was, I was at a Methodist school. Two hymns every day, sung in harmony for five years. It's a very good <laughs> musical training. Um, so there was that, and I remember singing the part of Judas in the St. Matthew Passion when my voice broke. And you know, it was a very rich um, musical life, generally at school and outside. Did, did that set you apart from, from no. others, or was that no. was a shared interest? No. I mean, it was, we were very lucky. The first 15 in our school were all great singers. We had four-part harmony in the bus coming back from rugby matches. Yeah. So there was no feeling of, oh, you know, if you're a singer, you're a sissy. That's, there was none of that. It was perfectly acceptable. It was simply part. I was at a very good school and very lucky in that. And um, Do I leap ahead to Dublin already at this stage? Uh, because that's when I next, that's the next yeah. bit I know about, uh, which is suddenly you're in your... In the early 20s, I think. Yes, in yes. Dublin. 20, actually. I arrived at the age of 20 with a battered blue suitcase with about 20 LPs. Remember those? Yeah. <laughs> what were the LPs, incidentally? Ah. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe this says it all. Things haven't changed, really. I've just got a few more. Um, <laughs> um, Benny Goodman, 1953 Carnegie Hall concert. Glenn Miller. Um, Schweitzer playing Bach on the organ. Talis from uh, King's College, uh, some Bach, also from King's College, um, and so Schubert string quartets. Um, I could probably <laughs> remember them Something all, but a I'm, memory for restaurant menus. <laughs> <laughs> but the range was there early, um, you know, uh, uh, and and uh, so that it's just expanded a bit. In parallel with this, your your interest in church going changes a little bit somewhere along the way because you got baptized after you came to Dublin. Yes, right? in St. Bartholomew's, which is the church in which I still worship and I'm very, very fond of. I would infinitely prefer to be there on Sunday mornings than not to be there. Uh, and I love the place and that is my community, You really. Now I've, uh, um, my present way of life, that is my main community and I'm very fond of them there. Um, and the standard of music is wonderful. It is very, very good. And that's what draws me and keeps me there. For anyone who doesn't know, we should say that St. Bartholomew's is Church of Ireland, but high church. Correct. With the commitment to the music of the European tradition in all its seriousness and sophistication that that implies. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So from plain chant to contemporary music, I mean, I was talking to the director of music recently about um, rehearsing some James Macmillan. So, you know, it's, it's the same range of music, a thousand years plus, uh, that is expressed in Gloria. And, and as you convey very movingly, I think, in this and in other conversations, uh, the music and, and the sense of community and your sense of belonging there all all go together. Absolutely. And, and I think in, in, a, in a little way, that's, that's the world we enter on a Sunday morning in Gloria. Would you, I know you don't plan it like that or you don't do it deliberately, but can you understand that it Absolutely. might sound a little like Well, that? I mean, the thing is that I love this music passionately. I'm, I'm, I'm an amateur. I like that word. Yeah. It's got a, a downside to it, but I... Not for me. Amateur means love. And I adore this music. I always have. Couldn't do without it. And it's wonderful for me to be able to share this love uh, and the knowledge I've picked up over 50 years or so with so many people. I mean, that's the great joy. And I mean, what a fortunate thing uh, yeah, to be able yeah. to do. And now I can do it not just over the airwaves, but with a wonderful book as well. So I'm Quite happy today. Quite happy. Before we go, before we give entirely the wrong impression, this was the 1970s. We're talking that I arrived in, in Dublin. Dublin. Yes. 1963. 63. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah worse. Worse again. This is the 1960s. You're not spending the whole week in church, nor are you 
just listening to church music. There's an no, awful I, lot else. Going I, on. I had I had a good job with a, a, a certain company that uh, brews a, a rather delicious beer and had a wonderful choir, the Guinness choir, very good. The Guinness players, I did quite a lot of acting. So I mean, there was there was a huge amount going on um, at the time, and I was involved in most of it. Um, did you pursue the jazz interest yes. as, as actively as the church music? I yes, think. probably more so to begin with, indeed. Um, yeah, Slatter is in Capel Street. Some wonderful live jazz down there. McGuinness Brothers. Uh, so, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I did, yes. Uh, I should say that, that to this day, there are probably as many jazz records as church music records in your house, are there? No? Uh, uh, nearly, but I don't think we should go down there. No, that's, <laughs> that's, that's a bit of an embarrassment. <laughs> Yep. No, I mean, I, I, yeah. I just love all sorts of music. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a real addict, you know. If somebody comes in and says, you know, have you heard this 14th century um, Korean snook? <laughs> I say, oh, yes, very nice. I'll give it a listen, you know. And uh, uh, very often, I, I, you know, so I am fascinated with new musical okay. experiences. How broad-minded are you? Can I test your, your broad-mindedness? Well, uh, well, Top of the pops. <laughs> but that changes so much, Eamon. I mean, I do think that it, your mood is terribly important as far as music is concerned. There are some times when I remember coming back from work and arriving back, at very tired, and all I needed was 15 minutes of Gregorian chant, and that did it for me. There are other times when I needed Count Basie blasting. You know, it, it, your mood change, your needs change, and so, I, although I could say, yes, well, I listened to this and this and this in the last week, um, I might not listen to that music again for another six months. So, I mean, there is, it very much depends on one's mood, and, uh, and I also love listening to the radio, you know, because then other people make the choice, which is very nice. Um, now, I have been known to rush to the radio and turn it off rather quickly, so there are some things that I don't care for, you know, I'm not, you know, it's not absolutely everything. The most important thing, I think, is that the music is uh, beautifully played and played with, uh, by musicians with integrity who know and love the music, of whatever sort. Yeah. At one stage, uh, you became actively involved as a promoter, as, a, as an yes. impresario, yes. in yes. Uh, bringing uh, early music. Early music. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I've always felt, isn't it funny how um, the, the two centuries that are most commonly heard on radio are the two centuries from 1800 to 2000. Now, my favorite two centuries, there's no doubt, is 1550 to 1750. Coming up to 1600, which was a wonderful peak of Monteverdi and all these guys, and then the, the other astonishing peak of Bach. Um, and I've never really been able to understand people's um, obsession with 19th century music. I mean, I love it, some of it more than others. You know, I don't go for big band Beethoven or, or um, you know, a huge oh, When Will It End Bruckner. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but I love every string quartet. I love the intimacy of the string quartet, which I think is the most wonderful and intimate type of music making there is, um, of all sorts, you know, so I, I'm not anti anybody, there's nobody would, 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 be, would be crossed off my list. I'm not a huge fan of brass bands, uh, electric guitars played, you know, you wouldn't get me really to uh, get terribly excited with very loud electric guitars, although I wouldn't rule out popular music at all necessarily. Um, and I do remember my children when they were watching Top of the Pops or something. I would, if they said, oh, this is wonderful, come and listen, come and listen, I would do so. There was a quid pro quo, and they would have to come and listen to my stuff sometime. <laughs> uh, that was okay. <laughs> I, I think one, one of the reasons that enthusiasts for early music find themselves pushed into, uh, into a, a sort of confrontational position is that they campaigned for so long. In the beginning, it was so exciting. You were trying to overturn the way things were done and trying to get this music heard 
in a new way. It, it, it was a well, I think it's to get it heard at all, I and mean, that's the problem that, you know, uh, um, I used to listen to the masses of Josquin de Pre 30 years ago. No, very, very few people, uh, other people did. And it simply wasn't known. It wasn't played on the airways. And I think this is one great thing that um, James Crimmins insisted on doing this from the early part in lyric. He said, no, we won't have a specialist early music program. We will simply have early music as part of music. Of music. Yeah. And that's, of course, is how it should be. Um, but um, I am still sad since we ran those five early music festivals. It has to be said that there are very few promoters of really good early music. It, it's still, people tend to play safe, play 19th century, um, you know, the piano recital and... Well, it has um, come on a bit, probably, as, as a, as a spin-off from the international early yes. music movement, is the authentic instrument performance yes, of... Yes, yes. Mo Mozart, music, and, Mozart, yes. Haydn, well, I mean, I, I, I think uh, that's absolutely true. It's very interesting now that it's come right into, into the 20th century. And Elgar, for instance, in his symphonies, wrote in the score vibrato, where he wanted it. And what that meant was that he did not want it everywhere. And that's what, and that's what he usually gets, as does uh, uh, you know most other nineteenth-century symphonies. This is so, your audience. This is an informed audience. But in case there's anyone here who who, 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 need, who needs it spelled out, vibrato is the little oscillation of the of the tone for expressive purposes. Yes, but you don't want to be expressive all the time. And I mean, I love vibrato, where you have a nice phrase and there's vibrato at the end to colour it. That's just fine. I'm not anti-vibrato, but there was a time, and if you listen to, um, you know, recordings from the 1940s, where the fiddle players were doing this all the time, and I don't see any point in this. And and so uh, I'm I am I do think that the lessons learnt by listening to early music, you know, listening to generally to Baroque and Renaissance music, have been brought forward into all music. Uh, to, 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 to great effect. Um, and I actually love listening to a Bruckner motet, for instance. I love Bruckner motets. Don't let anybody think I've written him off. Short. And, well, short and very much to the point. Very, and, and, but he, to hear a contemporary choir singing those 19th century um, uh, works with less vibrato, I won't say without, without, it means it's so much clearer and so much cleaner. And I, I'm a, I think that all choral music has, has uh, hugely benefited from the early music movement. I can't resist inflicting on you again Roger Norrington on uh, vibrato. It came into fashion in the 20s and 30s along with smoking. And <laughs> to go the same way. <laughs> yes, good old Sir Roger, that's, yes, uh, well... It was uh, your involvement with, with promoting the early music festivals that got you into broadcasting. Yes. Yeah, well, no, actually it was my singing in choirs. Oh. There was a wonderful um, group called the RT Chorus. When the, the RT singers were too small and the fill, or what was it called, the fill in those days, the big one was too big. There was a sort of 30-voice chorus that was got together. Um, and I used to be invited to sing. So that's how I found myself in those recording studios in Portobello. And... Uh, um, I think my interest and love of early music was known, and I was asked would I like to do some programs on early music. Um, that was in the early 80s. And so that's when it started. And they were, they were the forerunners of Gloria. I mean, the format um, of Gloria I, to this day owes a little to those. I, well, no, I think the, 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 how, how Gloria started was, in fact, uh, from... Cross currents, Ruth Ruth Buchanan and um, uh, my wife, who's a theologian, was in with Ruth, and Ruth said to to her, "I I want uh, to do a really interesting program on Christmas music," and my wife Anne said, "I think I might know somebody who would help," <laughs> so that's how we started. I might the first prototype, uh, Gloria, started in um, 1990. 
six, something of that, and a long time ago. On FM3. On FM3, that's Korea. right. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. No, actually it was on RT1. No, that's sorry. It was my jazz program that started on FM3, um, Contempo. And that Saturday on, on FMT. No, uh, that's uh, we had a, a couple of um, of Glorias, and then it was one of the few programs to slide over to Lyric when Lyric opened, and hasn't missed a Sunday since. <laughs> what was it you said when you were start? Was it when you were starting with Gloria? You talked about broadcasting to listeners of all faiths and of none. Yes, I mean, I do believe that. I, the, the thing about an awful lot of the music you hear on Gloria is that you don't, I, you know, by all means, keep music live. Yes, I'll, I'll march to that. But unless you happen to live close to um, the few cathedrals or churches that have a, a, a very high um, musical tradition, you, you can't, you know, it doesn't transfer to the, to the concert hall. Or not much of it does. You hear a Bach passion, but... You know, not an awful lot of the music you heard, but there is a wonderful array of recorded music, and that's what I wanted to uh, use on Gloria. The, 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 um, the Gregorian chant, the chronological sequence, I had from a very early time, um, and I think I like the elegance of that, and I like the fact that it, it is a millennium of music, and it, you know, moves from from one to the other. And people have said that they like um, seeing how the language changes over the period. Um, but as you probably uh, uh, listeners will probably be able to tell, I tend to dawdle in the 16th century. <laughs> uh, there was one program recently, I looked at the clock, an hour had gone by and I was still with Josquin Depre. <laughs> I was halfway through. So yes, that's, that's where my, my heart is. I, have and I do say. sometimes have the impression, but maybe that's because I know you. I know it is because I know you, that, yeah. that after the Bach cantata, I can hear a deep breath being taken before we have to get into the later 18th. And, Perish the thought, the 19th. No, 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 no. I, 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 I that's, that, I, I, I love uh, the music of, of later periods too, no, in a different no, no, way. No, no, no. It's different music, it's in a different way. It, of course, it depends on how well it's done, but the ri I love the richness. I mean, uh, I re remember my poor mother, um, who used to, she loved romantic music, she loved Brahms, and I used to be so dismissive. I say, oh no, please, not again. But now I couldn't do with Brahms. That's the other thing I think. Sorry, I couldn't do without Brahms. Um, the other, the other thing is that people change as they, um, as they get older. I think. I mean, mu musical taste change. It's not just, you know, sometimes you, you you need this type of music, and the next day you'll need another type. As you grow older, your your musical tastes do change, there's no doubt about that. And now I will be very much happier in the, in the romantic a a area than I was when I was young. I know you, you, you insist that your involvement with church music, with sacred music, comes from the music rather than the sacred. Mm. Your way to the sacred is, yes. is, is through the music. But Christopher Dillon said in your hearing, Abbot Christopher Dillon yes. of, of Lansdall said in your hearing some, something rather lovely uh, a few weeks ago. Um, I can't recall his exact words, nor can I express it as beautifully as he did. But the gist of it was that Tim gives um, people in his position, professional Christians as he called them, uh, gives them pause for thought because his uh, record in involving people passionately with uh, the spiritual world on a Sunday morning compares rather favorably with theirs. Uh, which I thought was a lovely, it, was, it was a lovely thing to say and probably something that takes you aback a little bit, is it? Oh, come on, I'm, I'm quite uh, happy about it really, yeah. aren't I? <laughs> no, I mean, I, people are, for false modesty. you see, I think my name is down in a big black book in the Vatican as one of the causes of the, uh, 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 of the drop-off of attendance of mass, you know, that people tend to stay at home and listen to glory instead. No, seriously, I mean, I, I do think there are a lot of people who are searching for um, ways to express uh, 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 their spiritual side, who do not, for one reason or another, as they would have done when they were young, go to church regularly. 
um, and uh, somebody said, your program fills a God-shaped hole. Um, a, a bit taken aback, but in a way, you know, people are looking and they, they, they want a quiet time, they want to think about it, they can't go, don't wish to go to church. So, I mean, I do think it actually does, and I know from the letters I get from all over around the world, that people are very grateful for this reason. Can I push you a little bit on that? How far do you think it can fill, the music can fill the God-shaped hole? And um, I'm remembering uh, that you're married to a theologian. Yes. No, no, that, uh, that uh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to answer that because the answer is who knows. And, uh, you know, I, I, all I can say is that I don't need any further proof of the existence of God than the music of Bach. <laughs> and that I say, you know, that, that I believe. So that's, uh, that's for me. But everybody I, has a different sense. I'm not going to. I mean, the popes, as you, as you all know. I want to do is to sh yeah, is yeah. to share my love of yeah. this beautiful music, and from w what it seems is that there, there are many other people who respond and are grateful. So that's good enough for me. It's good enough for me too, by the way. I'm good. Sure I'm not going to ask the question. I I don't intend to hug uh, this all to myself and. If you, if you would like to talk to Tim, there will be an opportunity to take questions uh, before I finish. But I'll hold on to him for, for just a little longer and uh, ask you, how, how did the book come about? Uh, is, is it your idea <coughs> in the first place? No. Um, Eamon Hurley of Associated Editions, the wonderful um, uh, uh, um, publishers of the book, came to me and said, would you be interested in writing a book about music? I like listening to your program. I realize how little I know about these weird people I play, whose music I play, because you know, some of the guys are very weird, and very few people <laughs> know about them. So um, I said, OK, let me think about it. I, I, I knew Associated Editions were the very highest quality publisher, so I was happy from that point of view. And I came back, and I said, well, I would like to do it as long as it has the same feeling as the program. No. I didn't want to be asked to write, um, you know, anything academic or an encyclopedia or a dictionary. I just wanted it to be a companion book, and I liked that expression. I said I wanted it to be beautiful. I wanted it to have a, 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 a CD in it of the finest choirs, and I wanted it to be. Uh, informed but approachable so that you know yeah, nothing yeah. I didn't because the subject would put some people off so I said I don't I, w I don't want this I want it to be quite straightforward quite simple in other words have the same flavor that the program does so you saw it as having the the, the written content you were you had a fairly clear yes. idea early on as to what yeah. that would be did you see the CD going in there? Yes, from oh, the absolutely. That was, that was and I also saw it coming from Hyperion because there isn't anything better. So I was delighted, um, uh, as I will say publicly, across, across, across the quad later on. It's wonderful to have that quality of music and the quality of art as well, which I think is very important. But is the art the last? No, the not necessarily. I won't say last. I mean, it is a book about the history of sacred music. So what is Gloria? It's a book about the history of sacred music, an introduction to European, I'm not writing about Korean sacred music, um, but it is enhanced hugely by a CD and by wonderful Irish art. And that's great. That's one of the reasons why I'm so thrilled about it and why I really do think it, uh, there are a lawful lot of people who would be very happy to yeah. no, I th I have think it the art, in their the stockings. Makes, it makes the space, it creates that sense of, a, of entering a space where... Something well, it fits happens. very well with what I'm about, I think. Yeah, I, think so. yeah. I have to say, it's been a great... Th this is the last, uh, no, not the last, not the, last the latest in uh, a long line of conversations I've had with Tim. I look forward to continuing them in the years ahead. I never come away from a conversation with this man 
without feeling enthused about something new, informed about something because he's always heard it or seen it or been there before me. <laughs> and uh, it's all part of entering what I think of more and more since the book came out as, as Tim's world. And Tim's world is rather, rather a wonderful one. I think the fact that you're here this evening means that you agree. Tim, thank you. Good luck